the enemy of our souls, I'd suggest would like to shame us even in the place of prayer. Because what he's doing is he is getting you to lay down the very sword that God has given you. Your praise is a weapon, but your prayers can pull down strongholds in spiritual high places. Christ is my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand, when everything around me is shaken. Oh, I've never been more glad that I put my faith in Jesus, because he's never let me down. He's faithful through So I
calling on the God of Jacob, whose love endures through generations. I know that you will keep your covenant.
captives then you're freeing hearts right now you are the same
Hallelujah, Lord, we thank you that we are not alone and that in battle that our greatest help still comes from you. No matter what the enemy throws against us, we thank you that you are greater. Jesus, your name is greater than any sickness or disease. It is higher than any conflict or lack that we might be facing. Jesus, you are high and exalted and you are blessed. We pray that today that our praise might reach your throne and that you might know how much we appreciate you, how much we value you, how precious you are. Jesus is precious. And we pray that today that you would have your way in our hearts and in our lives. Lord, you know every circumstance, every situation that we're dealing with. You know that which we're going through. And whether our need is physical, financial, spiritual, or emotional, I pray, Lord, that right now that you would touch us and that you would release the power and the presence of your Holy Spirit to come and to fill our lives again. Touch your people once again. Be with us, Lord. Bless us and make us a blessing, we pray. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. amen. Turn and greet one another in the name of the Lord. Give somebody a high five. Say hello. Love on those around you, and then you may be seated. And so I'd like to share with you a message that I've entitled, How to Handle Adversity. And in your Bibles, uh, it would be f uh, found for us, a passage found in 2 Chronicles chapter 20. And we're going to be considering some 23 verses today, and then I believe that this will be a part one and a part two of a mini uh, message series of what God wants to say to us. In fact, I could have entitled this message, The Battle is the Lord's. And that song that was sung is part of our worship. Wow, I'm just so thankful for our worship team. I was blessed last week as uh, Johan led us, but isn't it great to have uh, Pastor Esther and John Luke back with us? Come on, let's say a big thank you to them and a welcome back as well. Now, the story is told of a poor widow who had five young children, and uh, she was struggling to be able to make ends meet, so she decided that she would spend every day at the beginning of the day, she would call upon the name of the Lord and believe that God would help her. So she came out on her porch, and uh, she raised her hands to heaven, and she prayed out loud. She said, Lord, you know that I have no food in my pantry, and there is nothing for me in my kitchen cupboards to feed my children today. I need you to supply my needs. Make a provision for me today. And she would pray that, and she prayed it out loud. Well, she lived right next door to somebody who had no faith at all. In fact, he called himself an atheist. He was somebody who didn't believe in God, and every morning he would hear this cry, and and it was something that began to make him feel sick on the inside and nauseate him, and he was tired of hearing her spiritual talk on a daily basis. So he decided one day, I am going to fix 
that lady. I'm going to teach her a lesson. And so he went out in the afternoon, and he bought several bags of groceries, and then in the middle of the night, he went out onto her porch, and, and very stealthily, he placed several bags of groceries. And as it approached the early morning hours, he rang her doorbell and hid in the bushes. Well, the lady came out, as was her routine, and, and uh, she was uh, ready to stretch her hands to heaven when she looked down and she saw the bags of groceries. Well, at that point, she not only lifted her hands to heaven, but she burst into some kind of a happy dance. And she began to express joyful praise to God. She said, thank you, God. You have supplied all my needs even before I've asked. Thank you for answering my prayers. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Well, the longer she went on, the matter the atheist got. Remember, because he was hiding in the bushes. And so he decided, okay, here's my chance. And he stepped down. And he looked at that lady, and, and with arrogance in his voice, he said, my good neighbor lady. He said, it wasn't God who supplied your needs today. I did. He said, see how foolish it is to trust in a non-existent God and to give him credit for what he didn't do? I'm the one that paid the bill. Hearing him clearly and looking at him right in the eyes, the woman immediately burst into another happy dance and she responded with another sincere prayer of thanksgiving. And she said, God, you are even greater than I'd ever imagined. You are so wonderful and so amazing. Not only did you provide for me and my family all the food that we need today, but you even used the devil to provide it. Amen. Come on, give the Lord a hand of praise. Amen. <laughs> God is able. He can take that which the enemy meant for evil and he can cause it to work together for our good and for his glory. Can anybody say amen to that? And it's an important declaration because I want you to know that very often in our lives that we deal with significant adversity and we deal with significant challenges and it's important that we understand that God is great and that he is greatly to be praised. But today I want to talk about how to handle adversity. In our Bibles, it's 2 Chronicles chapter 20. And when we begin right from the very beginning of the chapter. That's a good place to begin if we're going to begin at the beginning. Amen. All right. Profound message today, Pastor. Thank you. We begin by being introduced to a king by the name of Jehoshaphat. Can you say that with me? Jehoshaphat. And some of you said, I know Jehoshaphat. He was the one that jumped all the time, right? Jumping Jehoshaphat. All right, I guess you need to be a little older than maybe most of you are to be able to recognize that phrase. Man, that was... A, a popular phrase when I was growing up. But he was king of Judah, and he had a problem. And as a result of the king, Jehoshaphat, having a problem, God's people had a problem. And so simply stated, even before we begin to read the scripture, I want us to know that none of us goes through problems alone. But inevitably, there are those that are going through it with us. And it could be a family member. It could be a friend. It could be a son or a daughter. It could be a husband or a wife. It could be an aunt or an uncle, a mother, a father. Inevitably, when we hurt, those around us hurt as well. In fact, the Bible tells us that in the body of Christ, when one hurts, 
all hurt. And so God's people found themselves in a situation where they were facing an imminent attack of the enemy. In fact, the enemy was right on the doorstep. And I don't know whether you've ever faced an imminent attack of the enemy before or not, where it feels like he has encroached and he's gotten close, and how did he get this close to me? Things can catch you by surprise. And if you're here today and in your situation, you're feeling that there is something that has come to you as adversity that has caught you by surprise, then there is a message for you, not just today, but next week as well. And remember, this message could have been titled, The Battle is the Lord's. But I want us to consider what Jehoshaphat and the people of Judah's problem looked like. So let's read the description of it as found in 2 Chronicles chapter 20 in verses 1 and 2. It says, after this, the Moabites and the Ammonites and some of the Meunites came to wage war against Jehoshaphat. Now let's pause there just for a moment. I want us to notice that it says that these people groups came to wage war against who? One person. This wasn't about attacking Judah. This was about hitting the head of the nation because they felt that if, if the head could be taken down, that the rest of the nation would dissolve around what had transpired. So the war was against Jehoshaphat. Quite interesting to notice the way that the scripture says that. So this is a personal thing. And some people, verse 2 says, came and told Jehoshaphat, a vast army is coming. Notice the word vast, big, large, many, is coming against you from Edom, from the other side of the Dead Sea. What did the Dead Sea, what's on the other side of the Dead Sea? It's the place of bondage. How many know what I'm talking about? So armies from the place of bondage are coming to attack you because they want to either kill you or bring you back to the place of bondage. Does that make sense? Just a quick uh, you know, explanation of that. And then it identifies the name of the place and says that that is En Gedi today. And so as we look at this, I want you to know that this is very historically rooted. This battle did take place. It's found in the Chronicles, which are the records of the kings. And so this is not something that is imagined. This is an acute story for us to learn some lessons from. This is something that is rooted in history that we can still glean some lessons from if we look at it. So I'd suggest that in this passage, we can find out how to handle adversity. And today, I'd like to introduce to you eight different ways to do that. And there are many things that we may do in a time of crisis. Some cover it up, almost like denial. Some give up. You know, some, uh, you know, don't know what to do, and, and so they panic, while others pray. And I'm not sure where you find yourself in that process, but the Bible tells us, and we're about to read it, that verse 3 identifies Jehoshaphat's response, and his response is that he resolved or he determined to inquire of the Lord. And I'd suggest that one of the very best things that we can do when faced with a crisis is to turn to God. Don't run from him. Run to him, not away from him. Why? Because he cares for you. Why don't you turn to your neighbor and say, hey, God cares for you. Come on. 
Let's say it now. God cares for you. He really does. And so this was a decisive moment in his life. It's so decisive that he's looking and he is, he's been told that the enemy is about to attack him. They have gone all the way across the Dead Sea, right? Because God did not part the waters to provide the enemy a pathway through. So they either went around or they sailed across and they got there and they began to march and so they are about, in En Gedi, they're about 40 kilometers away from the capital of Judah. They're about 40 kilometers away from Jerusalem. And so the enemy is particularly close. And this is the moment where Jehoshaphat personally is feeling the pressure of response. And there are a lot of things that he could do. But this was the moment where it's important that he has a determined response. God has put him on the throne for such a time as this. And let me tell you that, that there are times where, where we can learn or understand that it's not the crisis that destroys it's what we do or do not do when the crisis hits. How many know what I'm talking about? We cannot avoid all crises. In our lives, bad things can happen even to good people. And, uh, you know, the enemy of our souls, he wants to destroy. He wants to kill and he wants to steal. He wants to steal our joy. He wants to kill our soul. And he wants to just destroy even our family's heritage. And I'd suggest that how we respond to the times of adversity is that which defines us. It's in those difficult moments, in those trying hours, in those dark days when we are going through it, that we can discover what we are made of. Amen? And so Jehoshaphat, what did he do? What would you do? When your land is about to be attacked by an enemy, when the enemy is 40 kilometers away, what would you do? Would you call people to fight? Would you rally the army? That would make sense. And that would be the thing to do if we were thinking of all of this from only a natural perspective. Because Judah had a large, well-trained army, and Jehoshaphat could have called up all of the troops. But on this occasion... Jehoshaphat did something that was completely unexpected. What did he do? When told that the enemy was on the doorstep, number one, Jehoshaphat proclaimed a fast. What? Are you kidding me? Jehoshaphat did something that by human standards makes absolutely no sense. He called a nationwide fast. He said, we need to boycott food, amen. And he called the people to come and to join him in Jerusalem for a prayer meeting. What kind of battle plan is that? Second Chronicles chapter 20 and verses 3 and 4 says it this way. It says, alarmed. Jehoshaphat resolved to inquire of the Lord, and he proclaimed a fast for all Judah. The people of Judah came together to seek from the Lord indeed. They came from every town in Judah to seek him. Now, I don't know too much about what's involved in proclaiming a fast. 
it would be very difficult for me to stand up in front of us all and to say, hey, you know what? I need you to fast. And yet sometimes the only way that we see the miracles that God has in store for us is when we fast. Can anybody say amen to that? And there's something about that. And so this week I think of speaking even with a couple individuals who told me that they were fasting for a significant breakthrough this week. They shared that with me. And they said, Pastor, would you believe with me? And I said, man, I'm with you. And I'm humbled even by the approach that you're taking. And so the first thing Jehoshaphat did was he called a fast. The second thing is that people came together and Jehoshaphat prayed. In the scripture, it doesn't tell us that they prayed. It says that they fasted but, and that they came together. And there's something significant about that. You know, sometimes we think that, you know, well, I can't go to prayer meeting because, you know, at prayer meeting, I, you know, I can't go because I don't know how to pray like those others. I can't articulate my words to God the way that they do. And so we miss out of the blessing of being there because we feel our insignificance. And the enemy of our souls, I'd suggest, would like to shame us even in the place of prayer. Because what he's doing is he is getting you to lay down the very sword that God has given you. Your praise is a weapon, but your prayers can pull down strongholds in spiritual high places, and it's an incredible thing. You can take up that weapon. So I'd suggest that, you know, one of the things that we could do is even, uh, you know, speak with uh, Roger, who, uh, you know, is the one who administrates and coordinates our prayer meetings. You can speak either to him or to Frank Gangaram, who, you know, together these visionaries got things going, and we've been praying every Sunday morning for years now. And you can say, hey, I'm not sure that I'm comfortable with praying out loud, but I'd sure love to be there. I'd love to show my support. I'd love to agree in prayer, but, but you know, don't call on me quite yet. I'll let you know when I'm ready to pray. And how many know that's one of the things that we try to do is be sensitive even when calling on people to pray? It's never a good thing when you stand on the stage and you welcome somebody to come to the platform to lead in prayer and you watch as they get up and walk out the back door, amen. That's not good. That is really awkward. You're not entirely sure what you're, you should be doing right then and there. But the fact of the matter is is that prayer changes things. And, uh, and common sense might have told Jehoshaphat, listen, we don't have time to waste time. You know, there's a time to pray and there's a time to fight. And with the enemy on the doorstep, our time to fight is now. But Jehoshaphat, as the leader of God's people, said, no, no, no. The time for us to pray is now. And don't miss it. And so the Bible tells us that Jehoshaphat began to pray, and his prayer is recorded in 2 Chronicles chapter 20 and verse 6 to 12. And it is both simple and profound. We're going to read it. In fact, let's pick it up at verse 5. It says, Then Jehoshaphat stood up in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem at the temple of the Lord, in front of the new courtyard and said, so here's the prayer. Lord, the God of our ancestors, are you not the God who is in heaven? You rule over all the kingdoms of the nations. Power and might are in your hand and no one can withstand you, our God. Did you not drive out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and give it forever to the descendants of Abraham, your friend? They have lived in it 
and built in it a sanctuary for your name, saying, if calamity comes upon us, whether the sword of judgment or plague or famine, we will stand in your presence before this temple that bears your name and will cry out to you in our distress, and you will hear us and save us. But now... Here are the men from Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, whose territory you would not allow Israel to invade when they came from Egypt. So they turned away from them and did not destroy them. See how they're repaying us by coming to drive us out of the possession you gave us as an inheritance. Our God, will you not judge them? For we have no power to face this vast army that is attacking us. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. I want us to look and see how Jehoshaphat prayed. In fact, let's break it down. He begins by praying, God, you are the God of our fathers. You are the God of heaven. Then he says, you rule over all kingdoms. You have power and might. And then he says, no enemy can withstand you. You are God. How many of you know that in each of those statements so far? He hasn't talked about his problem. He's talked about his provision. He's not talked about the greatness of his enemy. He has talked about the greatness of his God. And it's amazing. And he goes on and he says, you were faithful to us in days gone by. You kept your promises. And so it's important, even as we look around, we can see how God has so faithfully kept his promises in so many lives. And then he said, when we call out to you in times of calamity, judgment, plague, famine, or distress, you hear us and you save us. How many know that's good news? Because some would say, well, you're getting what you deserve. I want you to know that in judgment, we can still call upon the name of the Lord. And he saves and he helps. Can you say amen to that? And that's important because if the enemy of our souls has, has just fed you a load of his manure and has got you believing that you're going through what you're going through because, I want you to know that you can realize that that manure can be fertile ground and you can grow up stronger than ever just by pushing through. But he says then, he says, we are, and also let me just mention that in the whole list of things that we can call out to God in, plague is listed. What is plague? Plague is something that we've just gone through. Plague is one of those things that are kind of rare, but what's significant about plague is plague is an unseen enemy. So God has the ability to help us even when we are facing an unseen enemy. Can anybody say amen to that? And that's good news. But Jehoshaphat knows this enemy. He knows that this is a battle of three against one. He knows that this is a vast army. And so now he humbles himself in the place of prayer, and he says, we are powerless, but you are powerful We don't know what to do, and so our eyes are on you. Sometimes we think, man, when I don't know what to do, I got to do something. Sometimes the best thing that we can do is just wait on the Lord. Can you say amen to that? They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They will mount up with wings as eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. Each movement in that verse from Isaiah is a movement forward. And it's all about putting one foot in front of the other. And God help us to do that. 
I've said to many that my spiritual gift, I believe, is, is quite simply stated as putting one foot in front of the other. I may know that sometimes the easiest thing is just to collapse, to pull the covers over your head and to say, I'm done. But we need to push ourselves out of that bed. And we need to get up and we need to hit the ground with our feet and we need to begin to walk. Because you can walk into a place of new blessing. You can walk into a place of new freedom and of new opportunity and of greater things than you've ever seen before as you keep putting one foot in front of the other. So number three is when Jehoshaphat humbly prayed. And I love this. Families stood together before the Lord. Did you catch that? Wasn't just the moms and the dads. It wasn't just those who were a little bit older. It was families. Look at what the Bible says. It says, all the men of Judah with their wives and children, and just in case you were wondering, and little ones stood there before the Lord. Man, I'm so thankful for a godly heritage. I'm so thankful for a mom and a dad who dragged me to church even when I didn't feel like going. How many know what I'm talking about? I mean, if you were listening to John Hagee, he said, I had a drug problem growing up, amen. I was drug everywhere. They'd grab me by the ear and they'd drug me to church, all right. Interesting use of the past tense of that word. But I'm saying, man, I was dragged to church for sure. And, uh, you know, it was uh, such an upbringing that when I slept over at a friend's place, we used to have those kinds of events. And, you know, I could only sleep over on a Saturday night if there was an assurance that I would get to church somewhere the next day. It didn't matter. Which church that I went to, it didn't matter what the denominational stripe was, but I had to be at church. That was the rule. And my parents, you know, not to say that they lacked in trust for me, but one of the ways that I could show them that I was at church is I could bring a bulletin from that particular church home so that we could then discuss the message. I heard that cough, amen, all right. Because you remember that all too well. And some would say, I can't believe you had that kind of a strict upbringing. Listen, I'm so thankful. Because a river has banks. How many know what I'm talking about? A swamp has none. And so I grew up, you know, as with some focus in my life. My parents had a dream as to, as to what God had in store. They let him determine the call, but they still wanted me to succeed. And they knew that, that in order for me to succeed, that I needed to put God first in everything that I did. And so that's what's happening here. Jehoshaphat makes this determination. Let's call a fast. People came together. He prayed, and he prayed a humble prayer. And as he prayed a humble prayer, God, we are powerless. We don't know what to do. Guess what? The spirit of the Lord began to move. Isn't that awesome? That when we say, God, I am powerless. God, I need you. Aren't you thankful that he sends his Holy Spirit to be in us? And to work through us, the Bible says, but you shall receive power after that the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And I want you to know that God's power is available to every one of us. In fact, this is what the Bible says. It's in verse 14 of 2 Chronicles 20. It says, then the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jehaziel, who is the son of of Zechariah. But it doesn't stop there. Jehaziel was actually the son, Zechariah rather, was the son of Benaiah, who was the son of Jael, 
who is the son of Mattaniah, a Levite, and a descendant from Asaph, whose Asaph, he was a worshiper, who stood in the assembly of God. So the one that the Spirit of God has moved upon is someone whose family was faithful to the house of God. Can you see that? Do you notice that? That's the reason that the heritage is listed. And I want you to know that there is something of tremendous significance for moms and dads to be able to realize, grandmas and grandpas, because maybe mom or dad is distant from God, but you can still bring that grandson or granddaughter. You can do what you can do. Let's do our part and let God do his. Can anybody say amen to that? And so the Spirit of God came upon this one that we've never met before. And what happens? That when we let God move and his Spirit move, there is an emphasis on his word. So number five is that God spoke to Jehoshaphat and to all of the people. It's in verses 15 to 17 where Jehaziel said, Listen, King Jehoshaphat and all who live in Judah and Jerusalem, this is what the Lord says to you. How many of you know that when you are going through adversity, when trouble has got you a pin down, when uh, that struggle is so close to you, how many of you know you need a word from the Lord? And a word from the Lord can make all of the difference in the world. So this is what the Lord says to you. Do not be afraid or discouraged because of this vast army. For the battle is not yours, but God's. Can anybody say amen? Amen. The battle is not yours, but God's. Can you turn to somebody and just speak that into their life? Hey, the battle is not yours, but God's. And I can tell you that that makes a difference. Where does that make a difference? I look and I see individuals who are praying, Pastor, I need my spouse to come to church with me. I don't know how long I can hang on without that spouse coming to church with me. And the best word that I can give you is the word that says the battle is not yours, it's God's. I can tell you that God can soften the hardest heart. I can tell you that God can turn the most resolute individual against him to a servant of God. And some would say, Pastor, well, then why is that not happening? How many know that the Apostle Paul on the road to Damascus, do you remember? He was headed to Damascus to do what? To persecute believers. He had a hatred on for the people of God. And what happened? Bright light, big voice. He hears Jesus. He's blinded by the sheer presence of God that he has the chance to see and Jesus speaks to him. In your life, Jesus can shine through and he can do in an instant what you never imagined possible in years. Does anybody believe that? Amen? And so the Bible says in verse 16, it continues, it says, tomorrow march down against them. This is the enemy. They will be climbing up by the pass of Ziz, and you will find them at the end of the gorge in the desert of Jeruel. You will not have to fight this battle. Take up your positions. Stand firm and see the deliverance that the Lord will give you, Judah and Jerusalem. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Go out to face them tomorrow, and the Lord will be with you. We are going to talk about tomorrow next week. I'm going to give you a little teaser at the end of the message as to what they did. But I want you to know that when they heard that word, what were they doing? They were fasting, they were seeking the Lord, 
Jehoshaphat prayed. God's spirit moved, and the word of the Lord was heard. What was their response to the word of the Lord? Bible says, number six, that all that were gathered worshiped. Some praised. In fact, verse 18 says, Jehoshaphat bowed down with his face to the ground, and all the people of Judah and Jerusalem fell down in worship before the Lord. Then some of the Levites from the Kohathites and Korahites, and by the way, the sons of Korah, were the ones that remained after judgment came because of idolatry. The ground opened up and swallowed Korah and many of his descendants. But the ones that were left, they acknowledged that God was God. And so they stood up and they praised the Lord, the God of Israel, with a very loud voice. And that's incredible because everybody worshiped. Some praised, but everybody worshiped. And I want you to know that there can be a difference between praise and worship. Worship sometimes has no words. Worship sometimes is just our posture. In this case, they fell down. They, they knelt and, and, and they, they fell down before the Lord. There are other times where worship is just hands up to heaven and tears streaming down our cheeks. But what's praise? His praise shall continually be on my lips. It's his praise. And when I praise, I express it to God. And so there is something that is powerful in both praise and worship. One isn't necessarily better than the other because we need to declare who God is. And tomorrow or next week or maybe even this morning, we're going to understand the power of praise. Because the praise can put the enemy into a state of confusion. And it's important for us to realize that because number seven on, on the eight things that Jehoshaphat did, the next morning, full of faith, God's people advanced against the enemy. How many of you know there are times when we're gathered together and when the spirit moves and, and we sense it and we know it and we fall down and worship or we stretch hands up and worship and, and there's something very genuine and there's a powerful praise service. There's one thing about that in being together in God's house and having it happen, but where are you on Monday? What happens the next day? When we're together, it's easy to feel the power of the unity that comes to us through the Holy Spirit. But how do we handle the next day? And the point here is that the next day, they came together and they began to march. And what's amazing about it is, is that as we look at who's there, we realize that the king is there for sure. His warriors are there, so they've got their weapons and they're ready to fight. But the Bible tells us that it wasn't the army that went first, but the worshipers led. Check this out. It says early in the morning, this is verse 20, they left for the desert of Tekoa. As they set out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, listen to me, Judah and the people of Jerusalem, have faith in the Lord your God and you will be upheld. Have faith in his prophets and you will be successful. And after consulting the people, Jehoshaphat appointed men to sing to the Lord and to praise him for the splendor of his holiness as they went out at the head of the army saying, what did they say? Did they say a mighty fortress is our God? Did they talk about the enemy's been defeated? No. They said, give thanks to the Lord for his love or his mercy endures forever. I want you to know that the power of God is released in our lives, not because we deserve it, 
but because he is so loving and he is so caring, he is so merciful and he is so kind. Man, a great song that I was introduced to this past week is a song that says that he is more than able. And there's a line in that song, and I shouldn't even try to quote it because I am horrible at remembering the right words to the worship chorus. But something caught me about this one because it said something that I need a miracle, but all he needs, all that God needs, is nothing. God needs nothing to bring you the miracle that you need. Can anybody say amen to that? He can make something out of nothing. He is the one who is able to speak into that place where you have no hope, and he is the miracle worker. He is the one who can do what nobody else can do, and we need to let him do it. We need to say, God, I don't need anybody's help. I don't need this drug. I don't need this medication. I don't need this other thing. And I'm not saying to disregard all of that. All that I'm saying is that your salvation is not in the carnal weapons of warfare. But our salvation comes from the Lord. Can anybody say amen to that? And man, if I'm putting my chips on the table and I'm betting on anybody, I'm betting on the great God that I serve. Can you say amen to that? And so there's something about it. And so people began to sing and they began to praise God. And this is where I'm picking up next week. Because as they began to sing and as they began to praise God, here's the point. God set ambushes for the enemy and completely defeated the opposition. You can read it. It's right in there. As people began to praise, it's not when they began to march. It's not when they began to pray. It's not when they began to fast. It's as they began to praise. God set ambushes for the enemy. How many of you know that the enemy in this particular biblical account, the enemy had ambushed Jehoshaphat? The enemy was within spitting distance of the capital city. The enemy had encroached on God's territory. And God said, oh, let me take care of this one. This is not your battle. The battle is the Lord's. And you will not need to fight. You'll need to stand and you'll need to see. And so standing and seeing doesn't mean doing nothing. It means that we stand in the presence of the Lord and we lift our voices and we begin to praise. And when we praise, good things happen. Can you say amen to that? Oh man, that is good. Look at this. Verse 22, it says, as they began to sing and praise, the Lord set ambushes against the men of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir who were invading Judah, and they were what? I can't hear you. They were what? Defeated. The Ammonites and Moabites, they rose up against the men of Mount Seir to destroy and annihilate them. The enemy turned on itself. And after they finished slaughtering the men of Seir, they helped to destroy each other. Man, this is an incredible thing. We're going to pick it up here next week, and we're going to see that the battle is the Lord's. And when faced with opposition, may we move forward with praise, and may we see the victory that God has for us. Can anybody say amen to that? Come on, give the Lord a hand of praise. Hallelujah. 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 And so we're going to share in a communion service. It's going to be shared a little differently than we normally do. But I want us to have those emblems close and handy. But even before we receive of the emblems, in just a moment, I'm going to invite you to stand. 
and we are going to join in this song that, that talks about, you know, the miracle worker, promise keeper, the God that is able to bring deliverance to us. And I want us to sing it, and I want us to make it our declaration. Can anybody say amen to that? Last week, it was about awesome. My God is awesome. He's the healer. He's the provider. He's the savior. He's the deliverer. And we took the opportunity to declare who God is. And in our lives, even as we are seeking for him to do something great in our midst, we need to say this is who God is. He is the way maker. Anybody believe that? Come on, let me hear you say amen to that. Amen. Stop, you never stop working Even when 
Jesus is our way maker. The Bible says that on the night that he was betrayed, that he took the bread. And after giving thanks, can we just pause and give thanks? Jesus, we thank you that you are all in. That in regards to our salvation, in regards to our deliverance, in regards to our healing, you are all in in we thank you that your body was broken so that we could be made whole and we pray that even as we break this bread together and partake that we might be able to remember that and to realize in our lives the blessings that come even from the breaking of that flesh that allowed the blood to flow by your stripes We are healed. Let us break the bread, partake, and receive. In the same way, after they had supped, he took the cup and he said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for many. How many? As many as call upon the name of the Lord, they will be saved. So we know that if you've called, this cup is for you. But I want you to know his blood was shed for us all. The sprinkling of the nations. No matter where we have come from, this cup is for you. Jesus loves you, and the greatest love of God that was ever demonstrated is when he laid down his life for us. The human measurement of great love is that you would lay down your life for someone else. If we apply that standard to God, then the greatest love that God ever showed us is when Jesus went to the cross. Imagine it now. Imagine his suffering Imagine the sorrow, imagine the struggle. Imagine how much it even 
pained the heart of God to see his son in that place. Now, for three hours, darkness was experienced in the middle of the day because he said, this is worse than anything you've ever seen, and I want to shield you from it. He never allowed us to see the depths of where our Savior went. So I'd suggest to you that there is no height in heaven that you can reach, that you will not find God, but that there is no depth even in Sheol or the grave or hell itself that you won't find him. He's near. He cares. He loves you. He wants to help you. And it's the blood that provides us access to God. It provides healing and it brings deliverance to those that apply the blood to the doorpost and to the mantle of their home, even in the land of bondage. They were free the next day and they were blessed walking out with riches because of the blood. Let us be thankful and let's partake together. Hallelujah. 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 There's nothing like the blood of Jesus. This morning we want to provide you with an opportunity to be anointed with oil. We want you to be able to come and stretch your hands to heaven and just give thanks to God for his mercy endures forever. And so some would say, but pastor, you know, God won't heal me. He won't help me. He won't touch me because I'm not deserving. Listen, none of us are. It's because of what Jesus did for us. Jesus saw every one of us as valuable. In fact, Jesus prayed. If you read it in John 17, you can read a prayer that Jesus prayed before going to the cross. And he said, Father, I pray that they might understand that you love them as much as you love me. What? What? You love them as much as you love me. I don't think that there's one person in this room that would argue against the fact that God loves his son, Jesus Christ. But you might give me a ton of reasons as to why God couldn't love you. I want you to know he does and he loves you as much as his son. You say, I don't believe it. I said, work on it for me a little bit. Unpack that a little more. Okay, thank you. I will. The value of something is determined by what someone is willing to pay for it. I could have have a house that is worth a lot of money, but if you're not prepared to give me that money for that house, it's not worth it. How many know what I'm talking about? The value is determined by what someone is willing to pay for it. So God looked at you, and what were you worth? What were you worth? The life of his son. Jesus died for you. So don't you think that he wants to help you? Don't you think that he wants to save you? Don't you think that he wants to bring healing to you? Sure he does. That same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is here. And the spirit is here to help us right now, to empower us and to move in us. But what we need to do is we need to take a step to the front and we just need to stretch our hands to heaven and to say, God, I need you to work. I need you to move. Our prayer team is going to come. And if you'd come now, prayer team, and then I'm going to invite the rest of us. If you have something that that you need God to move in, whether it's someone's salvation or whether it's a sickness or disease, whether it's a financial provision, whether it's a relationship uh, struggle that you're going through, whether it is a torment to the area of your mind, whatever it is, if you want God to move in your life, I want you to know the battle is the Lord's. And I encourage you to step up to the front and we'll anoint you with oil and we'll pray for you. The rest of us, we can worship because worship makes a difference. The enemy will be into a place of ambush if we can lift up our voices in praise. Let's do it now. Would you step out even as we sing? Here we are, Lord. Lord, we're coming to you. 
We're believing in your power. He loves you. We're believing in your might to heal us, to help us, to deliver us. He gave his love. Here we are. Here we are, Lord. It's me standing in the need of prayer, oh God. Oh God. Oh God, I need you. Oh God. I need you, Lord. Lord, see my brother, see my sister. 